I'm Dr. Herb Raymond Schneider, understanding stress here in our incontinence and how it can be most efficiently treated. A third of women between the ages of 29 and 60 experience urinary leakage. This problem can be easily treated. I'm Isabella, and I first started having bladder control problems about four years ago when I was uh, 49. Hi, my name is Angie, and I've had this, I started noticing problems before I even turned 40, like I was in my late 30s. Whenever I go out, I try not to drink anything several hours if I know I'm going out. I feel very frustrated. I'm tired most of the time because I'm not getting my rest. I'm up, up about four times a night. My word is frightening. It's very, it's extremely frightening to me. What is urinary incontinence? You can deal with it with uh, padding and maybe changing some of your habits regarding fluid intake. But believe me, there's a better answer. There are more types of incontinence than stress urinary incontinence, but we're not going to discuss those today. We're going to focus on this one group. Well, first, we just talk to the patient. We ask the questions, we carefully examine, and this includes a pelvic exam. The key to this is history. We want to know about your boarding pattern. But Early bladder diary is a key issue. It's important that we have a record that we can study. First, let's talk about the anatomy of continence. This is the uh, pelvis, but it shows a lot of muscle, but it's very important in keeping the structures that are above this area. We're looking at it from the bottom up. The bladder is a critical component in this regard, because a displaced bladder loses the ability to have good urinary control through the wear and tear of life, and particularly delivery. These muscles are literally stretched out of shape. Now, this is a pelvis in health. When you cough and strain, the down forces are pushed against the tailbone. When the support system is weakened, though, the bladder can rotate posteriorly and be displaced, and that has a negative influence on the shutoff mechanism. Let's look at the bladder. Our red diagram here is the bladder, and this represents the urethra. This is the pubic bone, and these are fascial attachments to the pubic bone. One of the main things that these do is they keep the bladder from rotating down underneath the pelvis, which allows the sphincteric mechanism right here to operate well. This is an MRI, a haste MRI, and it gives us very nice pictures of the anatomy of the pelvis and the urinary system. A healthy bladder rests in the pelvis in this, its normal state. When the muscles of the pelvis have been stretched out of shape, and here the bladder now has, has dropped and rotated underneath the pelvis. When the bladder is above the pelvic floor, when we cough and strain, the bladder and the urethra are equally exposed to that pressure, and there is a no difference in the pressure in the urethra as the bladder, and therefore there is no leakage. When the bladder falls out of the anatomic support system, now the bladder is exposed to those pressures of coughing, but the urethra is not. And what happens is we have stress urinary incontinence. This is the normal pelvis uh, of, let's say, someone quite early in their life. Here, after birth or delivery or just a tough job of supporting heavy abdominal content, these muscles tend to relax, and in some instances, they're even torn. And I think you can begin to understand how the bladder can fall through this opening. And here is this situation. Uh, here the bladder 
is low in the pelvis, and here the urethra and bladder neck are actually below the pelvis. And this is an image of a person who has stress urinary incontinence. Slings are mesh. We've used slings now for almost two decades, and the complications with slings are very minor. The complications with pelvic floor repair where we put into very large pieces of mesh uh, can lead to what we call an erosion. This by itself is a separate topic. I'm not going to deal with it further tonight. A goal, though, is to restore the anatomy of the pelvis. What we want to do is restore both position and the backboard function. We use what is known as a sling. The sling is mesh, but essentially, if you look at it in this cross-section, it's restored the position of the bladder, and it's given a firm backboard or a firm surface. So when the stress is exerted here in the abdomen, then that pressure compresses the urethra, so fluid can't come through it. And here is an overview. This is what's called the obturator. Foramen. This is one of the needles that we put through there to place our mesh. And that mesh, of course, is this sling that it supports the urethra and the bladder neck. And when coughing and straining occur, the bladder can't rotate and the downward force causes closure of the urethra rather than allowing it to be displaced and open so the urethra can float. The mini arc is based on exactly the same principle, but there's much less mesh involved, and it has a unique anchoring system. It's small. Another approach. This approach has a unique characteristic in that the mesh still goes underneath the urethra, but rather than coming laterally, it literally goes up over the anterior abdominal wall. And there are some circumstances where you need that additional support. This is the mesh. This is a little incision above the pubis where these sutures come out. And this is um, the incision. And oh, by the way, very efficient in giving us our common goal of making our patients thrive.